Danger, Dr. Danfield. Mr. James Smith, you will please rise. Yes, Your Honor. Before I pass sentence, have you anything more to say? Anything in your own defense? Only one thing, Your Honor. I'm innocent. The facts speak differently, Mr. Smith. The evidence against you is overwhelming. The evidence given at this trial conclusively proves that you shot your partner down in cold blood with full and complete deliberation, premeditation, and malice aforethought. I, therefore, by the powers vested in me by the Constitution of the United States of America, sentence you to be hanged by the neck until you are dead. May God have mercy on your soul. But I'm innocent, I tell you. Innocent. Innocent! Dr. Daniel Danfield, student of crime psychology, has many times provided the police with a solution to a baffling crime. As usual, there is an interesting case for the doctor today. We'll call it Mad Men Strike Swiftly. <laughs> Rusty and I were glad to come down, Warden. What's on your mind? It's about James Smith. He's due to be hanged at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. James Smith? Yes, James Smith? I don't believe I remember the case. Do you, Rusty? Me neither. Well, you know more what I fear in these cases. But I don't know about this one. I don't know. Well, just the fact that you have your doubts, Warden, is very interesting. Go on, please tell me more. Well, I have nothing to go on except a hunch. My mind tells me that Smith is guilty as a devil. The evidence against him was almost indisputable. Well, uh, then what does cause you to believe he might be innocent? Well, in the first place, he has continually protested his innocence. Oh? And in the second place, I've gotten to know Smith very well during his six-month stay here. And he just isn't the kind of a man who would commit a premeditated murder. I'll never believe it. I see. Just what is it you want me to do, Warden? I want you to talk to him. And if you come to the same conclusions... Do anything you can to save the poor fellow's life. Mm, you say he's due to be hanged tomorrow? Yes, at 6 a.m. Well, come on, then. We haven't very much time. Right away. But the, uh, you'll have to stay here. Women aren't allowed in the cell box. Okay. I'll wait here in the office and look at the pictures. It'll give me a chance to catch up on who's who in crime. Smith's cell is down at the end of the corridor, Dr. Manfield. Uh. Is there anything else you want to tell me about the case before I talk to him, Warden? No, I'll let him tell you himself. Yes, yes, that uh, will give me a better chance to determine the truth of his statement. Here we are. Oh. Right here. Good morning, James. Good morning, Warden. I brought somebody to talk to you. This is Dr. Danfield. A doctor? Well, I'm not ill. Uh, I... Dr. Danfield is a psychologist. We're coming in, Smith. But I'm not crazy, Doctor. I'm perfectly sane. Trying to claim insanity won't do me a bit of good. Quite true, quite true, Mr. Smith. No, I just want to talk to you. Well, I'm glad to have a chance to talk. There's very little time for talking left for me, you know. I know, Mr. Smith. Is there anything that uh, you'd care to say? Only that I'm innocent, Dr. Danfield. I see. Mr. Smith, I'd like to have you tell me the whole story in your own words. Start right at the beginning. But I've told it so often. Yes, yes, I know you have. But uh, I haven't heard it. Please, Mr. Smith, do as I ask. I shan't interrupt you. Well, if you wish. It all started when my partner, Felix Hammond, absconded with $50,000 of the firm's funds. This was a little over three years ago. Police searched for him in every state, but no trace of Felix was ever found. Naturally, a theft of this size completely wrecked the company. Creditors couldn't be paid, and I went down with the company. I couldn't start over again. Nobody would trust me. About a year ago, my wife left me. She's a frivolous woman, extremely extravagant. She likes nothing better than to bet on the horses. Of course, I was no longer in a position to satisfy her whims. A great hate was building up inside me. Slowly at first growing, ever growing. I fancied myself a martyr to my partner's perfidy. 
I swore if I ever so much as laid eyes on him, I'd kill him. And with as little compunction as I'd step on an ant. I even bought myself a gun for that purpose and kept it handy in my dresser drawer. Then on the day of Felix Hammond's murder, I received a phone call. Picked up the receiver. Hello? Yes, this is James Smith speaking. What's that? Say that again. Oh, yes, huh? Room 218, Burton Hotel. Yes, uh, yes, I'll most certainly be there. Uh, who is this speaking? Well, who are you? Hmm. Hung up. Oh, well, that doesn't make any difference. I slowly hung up the phone. I just received word that Felix Hammond was living in room 218 at the Burton Hotel. I walked to my dresser and opened the drawer. The gun was gone. What had happened to it or where I mislaid it, I don't know. But it didn't make any difference. I'd kill him anyway. I'd use my bare hands if necessary. Yes, that might even be better to feel his life ebbing through my own ten fingers. How I got to the Burton Hotel, I don't remember. I walked, I guess. It wasn't very far from my room. All this time my rage was building up inside. At last, I'd have revenge on the man who'd wronged me so fearfully. Several people, friends of mine who'd worked for me in my company, testified at the trial. They passed me in the street, and I walked along like a man in a daze. I don't remember. I do remember walking into the hotel. It was a cheap, dingy place, and there was a woman sitting behind the desk. Is Mr. Hammond in? Felix Hammond. Hammond? In Gardner Hammond living here. I mean the man in 218. Oh, that's Mr. Harland. Harland. Oh, yes, of course. He'd change his name. Yes, that's the man. I had his name a little wrong. Yeah, he's in. Always in. Never goes out. Thanks. I'll go right up. I started climbing the stairs. And with each step, my rage mounted. All the suffering I'd endured during the past two and a half years seethed and boiled within me like a molten lava of a live volcano. But I'd release it. I'd release it the moment I put my two strong hands around Felix Hammond's filthy neck. I reached the top of the stairs and walked down the hall. I glanced at the tarnished room numbers. The even numbers were on my right. 212. 214, 216, 218. I stopped. I reached out my hand to try the door. I heard a shot inside the room. I vaguely remember footsteps running inside the room. I seem to recall a window being raised way off somewhere. I don't know. Maybe in my imagination. I stood stunned for a moment. Had someone else done what I'd come to do? Had Felix himself cheated me again by taking his own life? Was I being deprived of my revenge? I reached out and tried the door. It was unlocked. I flung it open and rushed into the room. Felix Hammond was lying on the floor. Bound, hand and foot. His face had been gone over with a stove poker or something. It wasn't very pretty. And there was a bullet hole. A single, tiny bullet hole directly in the center of his forehead. Mr. Smith, you say there was just one bullet hole? Yes, I've heard only one shot. And uh, Hammond was bound hand and foot? Yes. All right, go on. What happened next? Well, there was a gun lying beside the body. I reached down and picked it up. It was my gun, Dr. Danfield. The one I usually kept in my dresser drawer. I see. And uh, tell me, what were your reactions, Mr. Smith? Your thoughts? as you stood there looking down at the dead body of your enemy. Well, it's a strange thing, Dr. Danfield. Confronted with the stark brutality of violent death, all my hate, my bitterness, my loathing drained out of me, leaving me shaken, empty, and afraid. I realized the full enormity of taking a human life. I realized that in spite of my overpowering rage, it wasn't in me to kill a man. 
I was still standing over him, holding my own gun when the police came. I never had a chance. But I didn't do it, Dr. Anfield. I didn't do it. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. In a moment, we'll return for the second act of Danger, Dr. Danfield. But first... And now back to Michael Dunn for the second act of Danger, Dr. Danfield. I didn't see how you expect to find anything here in Smith's room, Dan. Hmm? This room's been locked up for six months ever since his arrest. Yes, I know. That's why if I may find something, something that the police overlooked. You believe Smith is innocent, don't you, Dan? I not only believe it, but see, I know it. Every theory I have points to it. Oh, keep on looking, man. There's nothing in here but some old worn-out shirts. What becomes of this stuff when Mr. Smith is, is hanged? Everything in this room will go to his heirs or heir. In this case, I believe that there's a strange blank. Oh, hasn't she divorced him? Uh-uh, not yet. I can't find a thing. Say, say, I wonder. Rusty, doesn't that picture look a little out of line to you? Oh, sure. Nothing funny about that. Pictures are always getting out of line. Well, not when they're up as high as that one is. I think I'll take a look <laughs> at that. It's an old picture straightener. Let's <laughs> okay. see. Okay, there is something. Look. What's that? Yeah, let's see. That's an insurance policy. Dean Smith's insurance. <whistles> For $50,000. Wow, that's a lot of money. <sighs> I wonder who the beneficiary is. I was just thinking the same thing. Why don't you look? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, there's a state. What does that mean? His wife, unless he leaves the will sitting otherwise. Fifty thousand bucks? I bet a lot of people would take a chance on burning for fifty thousand dollars. Yes, indeed. Let's take a run over to his wife's apartment and see what cooks. <laughs> Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Jane Smith. Yeah. I'm Dr. Daniel Danfield. This is my secretary, Miss Fairfax. Yes. Yeah. Oh, is it, baby? Oh, you have company? Come, Jim. Says he's a doctor. Tell him we don't need any. Smile says we don't want any. I want to talk to you about your husband. Your husband? Yes, and uh, we're coming in to talk, whether you like it or not. Hey. Open the door and it's pushed, baby. Oh, no, you don't. Come on, Rusty. Hey, oh, you big log. Get to my head, my lord. Yeah, that's better. Hey, close the door, Rusty. You bet. Hey, what's the big idea of busting into a lady's apartment? You'll find out in just a minute. Well, Mrs. Smith, won't you introduce us to your friend? Huh? Oh, sure. Dr. Dan, you'll meet my boyfriend, Miles Henwick. Miles and me are going to get married after tomorrow. We sure are, baby. So you and Miles are going to get married, are you, Mrs. Smith? That's our intention. Apparently, your husband's execution tomorrow doesn't strike any veins of pity in your heart. Huh. Why should it? Smitty double-crossed all of us. He double-crossed everybody down at the company by not having his partner bonded. So when Hammond went off with the dough, what happened? We was all out of jobs. Oh, then you knew the soon-to-become late Mr. Smith. Sure I knew him. I was a truck driver down at the company. That's where I met Mamie here. Wasn't it, baby? Yeah. Mrs. Smith, did you know that your husband was carrying an insurance policy for $50,000 payable to his estate upon the event of his death? Sure I knew. Me and Mara have been keeping up the payments. Yeah. I got me about 200 bucks invested in that hanging tomorrow. Dan, do we have to stay here and listen to this? Just a few minutes longer, Rusty. Well, folks, I'm afraid you're going to be very disappointed. You're not going to collect that insurance. What? What's the big idea? The big idea is that Mr. James Smith is not going to die tomorrow. Why, ain't he? Because before tomorrow morning, I'm going to prove him innocent. Oh, no, you ain't. What's going to stop me? This pistol I got in my hand. Now, Myro, in your vernacular, what's the big idea? The big idea is that nobody's going to allow us up that execution tomorrow. You want to see him hanged, even if he's innocent? What do I care? The jury said he was guilty, and the judge sentenced him to be hung. When I pronounce him dead, Mamie and me is going to collect the insurance. Fifty thousand bucks worth. And then we're off to the races. Oh, uh, it won't work, Miles. Oh, yes, it will. You and your run here is going to sit right where you are. You're going to sit there all afternoon and all night. That is, if you sit quiet and don't make no fuss. Baby, how about putting on a pot of coffee? Sure, honey. And uh, if we don't choose to sit quietly? That'll be your tough luck. Hmm. 
Well, let's see. What do you think you'd better do? Well, at the moment, I'm for resting my hands and feet. Yeah. Yes, it does seem to be the most sensible thing at the moment. However, maybe it'd be better if I did this. Hey, what's the bigger? Hey, 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 get out of his hand. Get it, Rusty. Uh, 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 I'd rather get... Hey, 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 what do we do with them, Dan? Better tie them up, I guess. We've got lots of other things to do. You think they killed Hammond? Could be. However, Myrl here gave me a couple of good ideas. Okay, Rusty, let's press them up. Then you can go and turn off that coffee. In a moment, we'll return with the third act of Danger, Dr. Danfield. But first... And now, by Michael Dunn for the third act of Danger, Dr. Danfield. And uh, now, Rusty, let's uh, stop at this phone booth. Oh, uh, how many nickels have you got? Uh, four or five, why? Give me. I want to call four men. Four men who were former employees of Smith Company and who the judge said were the only witnesses at the trial. What do you want to call them for? Well, there's an old saying that a murderer always attends the funeral of his victim. Oh, okay. Here you are. But you'll have to pay me back. Uh-huh. Chalk it up to fun. Peter Henson? Look, this is Marl Fenwick. Yeah, yeah, Marl Fenwick. Jimmy Smith's wise boyfriend. Yeah. What do I want? Well, look, I'll tell you. Me and Mamie know what you've done. Uh-huh. That's what I said. Look, I'm talking from Mamie's apartment. We want that you should split with it. 50-50. Otherwise, we go to the cops. Hey, hey, don't hang up on me. What's the big idea? Dad, do you have to drive so fast? I'm afraid so, Rusty. We haven't a minute to lose. I want to get back to Mamie Smith's apartment. Well, slow down. Here we are. Good. Well, what are you going to do? Just sit here? That's the big idea. Hey, look there. Where? A little mousy man was running up the apartment house steps. Brother, is he traveling? Come on, Rusty, let's go. He's trying to get in. Uh, would you like to go in, my friend? Hey, who are you? Your nemesis, I'd rather like to believe. Oh, I uh, guess I must have gotten the wrong apartment. I don't think so. You're coming in anyway. Oh, no, I'm not. Damn, look out. Well, people have guns to make. Oh. Boy, are we good today. That makes three down. Any more to go? No, oh, this one should win us a cigar, Rusty. Here, take this key and open the door. Sure, Mike. Stop kidding, huh? Well, what did you suggest I do with him, Rusty? Just drop in. Okay. The two lovebirds don't look any too cheerful. No, no. Well, I might as well take the gags out and untie them. I'm not going to give us any more trouble. Here, I'll take baby. Uh-uh, uh-uh. I'll take baby. Okay, you take baby. There. There, there, there Mel. Yeah, make you feel any better? <clears throat> What's the big idea? Oh, Mel. Your conversation gets on my not. Hey, that's Peter Hansen, the bookkeeper down at the company. I had an idea, it would be. Uh, how are you doing, Mel? Only baby here wants to bite. What's the big idea? Oh, no, no, no. You two will make a wonderful pair. You can be monotonous together. What's the idea of bringing Hanson here? Peter Hanson, my dear baby, is Felix Hammond's murderer. Oh, that's a relief. I thought you were going to blame us. Uh, How uh, come? Wait, wait a minute, Marl. Uh, Peter over here is beginning to yawn. What? What hit me? Not Pete. Who? Oh, 
Uh, sorry you turned off that coffee, Rusty. That might help to wake him up. No, I'm, I'm all right. Good. Good. Come on over. Have a chair. He's got some matters to discuss. Oh. Now, first, let me put you straight, Mamie and Miles. Don't feel too badly because your husband is going to miss the gallows, Mrs. Smith. You wouldn't have gotten any of the insurance money anyway. <laughs> One aluminum cent. I'd like to know why. Because I've seen your husband's will. And the beneficiary on that policy wasn't you, Mamie. It was Mr. Smith's estate. Well, I'm his estate. I'm all he has. That's why I never got a divorce. Yes, yes, I know. When his company crashed, James Smith made a will. A will that enforced his estate to pay every single one of his creditors before you got a dime. Hey, baby, I didn't know that. I know you didn't, Miles. But, uh, Peter Hansen here did. <laughs> what? I said you knew that all the money was being used to pay the creditors. What's that got to do with me? You are the creditors. Damn. You mean it? Yes, indeed, Rusty. For the past two and a half years, ever since the company went broke, Peter Hansen has been buying up the claims. Buying them at zero cents on the dollar. Just recently, he glummed them all. How did you find out these things? A few discreet questions in the right places, Hansen. You've also been on the trail of Felix Hammond. And six months ago, you found him. You knew of Smith's terrible hate for Felix, so you set out to mold it to your own end. I hated Smith. If you'd listen to me, Felix wouldn't have been able to steal the money in the first place. So when you finally located him in the Burton Hotel, you went to Smith's room and stole his gun. You thought you might need it, as your intentions were to blackmail Felix, and uh, he might offer a few objections. He didn't have it there. Right. So the only thing left for you to do was collect Smith's insurance. Therefore, you beat Felix over the head with a poker, tied and gagged him, put in a call to Smith. When you heard him at the door, you shot Hammond, dropped his gun by the body, and left through the window, calling the police at the corner drugstore. Right, Mr. Hanson? I'm not admitting anything. You don't have to. You trapped yourself. When I found out that the beneficiary of Smith's insurance was the creditors, the rest was easy. It was easy to find out that someone had been buying up those claims. Who would that naturally be? Someone connected with a defunct company. Somebody on the inside. So I ascertained who had attended Smith's trial. There were four men, Hanson, all of whom have been formerly employees of Smith and Hammond. And you were among them. I testified for Jimmy. Testified as to the excellence of his character. Yes, yes, but you knew that your testimony wouldn't clear him of a murder charge. But why pick on me? Why couldn't it have been one of the other three? Because of the phone call you received this afternoon, Hanson. I represented myself as Myro here, Mamie's boyfriend. I told you I wanted a split. I also phoned the others. But they, not being guilty, passed it up as the work of a crank. But not you, Mr. Peter Hanson. You fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. Why? Because of your guilty conscience. You didn't dare refuse to come any more than you could stay away from the trial. Uh-uh-uh. Don't reach for your gun. I removed your fangs when I knocked you out. Now I'll call the governor. Yeah, it's been a great day. In a moment, we'll return for the conclusion of Danger, Dr. Danfield. But first... Now back to Michael Dunn for the conclusion of Danger, Dr. Danfield. Oh, Dr. Danfield, it's a great thing to be free again. Uh -huh. Spring, sunshine, trees, flowers, even the air. I never realized that even a little restaurant like this could be so big. You know, you can thank Dan that you're here. Well, I thank him. No, my child, I can never thank him enough. If ever a man was completely confounded by circumstantial evidence, that man was me. Pass me the sugar, my dear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Two whole spoonfuls that nobody can tell me no. <laughs> yeah, how you could ever have believed my wild tale is beyond me. Twelve of my peers listened to my story and thought I was lying like a trooper. Oh, it wasn't so hard. I know, but I had every intention in the world of killing Felix. His meditation and all. I can't blame the jury for convicting me. I'd have done the same thing had I been in their place. Well, it wasn't you who made the mistake, Smith. It was the murderer. I knew it couldn't have been you the minute I found out the condition of the body. Well, I don't see how that could have told you anything. He was just dead. No, Rusty, not just dead. He was tied and gagged, remember? And uh, there was only one bullet hole right in the middle of his forehead. Well, I can't think of anything that would make him any deader. <laughs> She's very cute. <laughs> well, anyway, that was a thing to prove Mr. Smith's innocence, at uh, least to me. Here's where the psychology comes in, Mr. Smith. Yes, yeah, men as mad as James Smith was when he went to see his ex-partner don't kill that way. For the rage as great as that, Smith would have emptied his gun into Hammond's body. 
He would never have been satisfied with only one shot. I believe you're right. Also, he would never have wasted the time to knock him out and bind and gag him. That called for coolness and deliberation. And uh, another motive besides just the passion of killing. Uh, well, all I can say is I'll never get mad again. <laughs> this has been too close a call. From now on, I'll temper my temper. <laughs> you uh, hear that, Rusty? Hmm? What? Well, what's that remark got to do with me? Well, uh, you didn't get that red hair out of a bottle. Or uh, did you? <laughs> 